versus Aspinall. Guys, today, right now, Aspinall is still the favorite. Does that not surprise anybody? I keep bringing that to you guys. And I know on day one it did surprise because I had a number of people leave me comments telling me that I had that wrong. So I had naturally assumed that by the time my piece came out and they went and checked it, that it had switched, that Pavlich was the favorite. Who I would expect to be the favorite, I naturally just... Assume that. When I was getting the comments, hey, Jay, you read that wrong. Hey, Jay, you got that wrong. I actually then go to DraftKings and look. No. Not only did I not have it wrong, Aspa, it's never switched. It's been close. These, I mean, these guys are damn near even money right now, right? I mean, you, you had a negative 145 to a plus 125. It is extremely thin. But Sergi never, right? So a few, a few bucks. One big bet comes in. It could sway it. And then possibly get straightened back down. It has never swayed. Tom is still the favorite. I, just, I find that surprising. I find it surprising for a number of reasons. I, I think possibly no, no more over than just on paper. Tom is one and one in his last two. And it took two years to get those two. And Tom is on short notice. He wasn't planning to fight here. Sergi has shut off the last six guys by knockout all in the first round. Did that in two years. Oh, and by the way, knew about this date. He was the backup fighter. So it just surprised me. Henry Cejudo came out and said he doesn't think they should be fighting for an interim belt. And then made a suggestion, which is always helpful, right? When somebody comes in and says they don't like something, it's always helpful when they do offer a corrective suggestion. And Henry did. And Henry said, I think it should be a number one contenders match. Now, it's an interesting debate. It's an interesting debate. When Henry says he doesn't think it should be a title match, as a champion, who's in this very coveted position and it took a lot to get to that position. I believe perhaps he looks at it a little bit different, which is if you're going to get up here with us, if you're going to be one of the very few belt holders, your path has to look something like us. It can't just be opportunity and opportunity alone. The best guys, the clear best guys, the advertised best guys, the signed best guys, the documented best guys, the ranked best guys can't show up. You can, and therefore you get the ball. I think that's what Henry's saying. I don't know that I agree. In fact, for that exact same reason, which is the best guys, the ranked guys, these guys, advertised guys, blah, 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 guys can't show up. I like that the guys that can are put in that spot. I think that's how it works. I think that's how it's always been supposed to work. I will tell you, if you followed this sport from its inception, you lived the very frustrating times. And the frustrating times is where competitions were happening. A system an abbreviated rankings, a champion of divisions was happening. But there was other guys who within the very small world that was MMA at that time had more celebrity. They were the guys that had put out DVDs prior to this. They were the guys that had done a scene in an action movie or two. They were the guys that got put on covers of magazines and convinced some editor at one of the magazines about how great they were and how great their secrets were, and the editor went with it, and he published them. And it, I mean, those little things like that can really blow you up. So those guys, and it didn't matter if they were claiming undefeated or if they were claiming secret skills, they had a level of notoriety, and those guys would then refuse to go and compete with the actual champions, but make claims that got over and worked with the audience that they were better. And that they are willing to get in there and prove it. But somebody's going to have to come up, and it was called pricing yourself out. Somebody's going to have to come up with a million dollars. At some points, it was 100000 But back then, that was just unheard of. That was unheard of money back then. 
well, I'll do it, but I'll have to come up with 100000 They would price themselves out, so they would never get in there. So now you got some guy that didn't have the fame, he didn't have the fortune, he just hard work and ground it out, but he's got the championship belt. He's doing everything he can do to show that he's the champion. He's willing to do whatever it takes. But the person perceived to be better is not a competitor and is not willing. And I don't know how you could look at somebody as a champion if they're not a competitor. I don't know of any respected sport where champions aren't also competitors, where they want to compete at all costs. Nothing would stop them from competing. Nothing. It is literally what they live for. And so when I see a situation, I think the competitors matter. I think the fact that Sergi and Tom are there. I think the fact that once Sergi and Tom got put there, no one spoke up. Surreal gone just by example that is most definitely a top guy. Most definitely. He didn't speak up. Tom tried to fight Surreal Gone. Tom tried to build something with Surreal Gone. I mean, I'm just sharing for you. He hasn't spoken up. Like, at some point, you do have to take them at their word. You get a group together and you say, who wants it? If no one raises their hand, no one wants it. If one guy raises his hand, right? I mean, at some point, that is how it's done. And when Henry talked about it should be a number one contenders match, I, I thought that was a very interesting concept. Because does Henry understand what he's saying? What he's saying, and I believe unintentionally, is push Stipe out of the way. That's what he would be saying. If Henry is saying that Tom and Sergi is the number one contenders match, then they're saying push Stipe out of the way. The biggest problem with that is Stipe didn't do anything wrong. Now, I, I most certainly don't think that John did something wrong by getting hurt, the poor guy. I'm just sharing with you, if anybody changed the deal, it is John. Stipe did not change it. Stipe agreed to fight. He's willing to fight. He's going to be in shape to fight. He's in shape. He's going to be on weight. He's on weight. Stipe cannot, in this scenario, be punished. Can we agree on that? Because he didn't do anything other than what he was supposed to do. But if you do what Henry wants to do, then you're pulling Stipe out. When John comes back, you're putting those two together and you're leaving Stipe out. I just, I don't think that's what Henry meant. I really don't. I think he didn't think it through. And I don't say this to criticize Henry. I do this that is we're having a debate. And one thing you have to know with the decision makers at the UFC, they take all those things into consideration. Things that you would overlook, things that I believe Henry, an expert, I mean, come on, Henry, greatest combat athlete ever, and turn into one of the more successful coaches. I just share with you, I don't think he thought of that. And we do have a very unique situation. And in this regard, I, I definitely do agree with Henry. Where we have no rules, we have no clear set criteria or rules or procedures or even policies, which are very weak, but it's a fancy word. People love when you throw out the word policy. They don't understand. There's no, there's nothing on it. But the point that I'm getting at, we don't have any of those around the interim championship. So when you're in a spot like that, you would then defer back to something known as precedence. If nobody sets a policy and you don't have rules down, you will defer back to precedence known as an industry standard. And the precedence around the interim championship is that it is the interim champion, if healthy and able, will compete with the undisputed champion when he returns. That is the history, which thus makes it for sure a number one contenders match. And the information that we're given so we're going to do the interim championship, but when John heals, which is this time, about this time next year, that it in fact will be Stipe, which is great because Stipe did nothing wrong. So I think that we understand that. But to do an undisputed match, which would keep Stipe the number one contender, right? People always get this language wrong. They always get it wrong. Who's ranked number one, they like to say is the number one contender. Number one contender is whoever has the signed bout sheet. It means who's next. 
Who's next is the number one contender, just so you know. And that, from what we're told, would be Stipe. So it is a little bit of a tricky position. And Stipe and John are both saying that that fight will be their last fight. So imagine that. Let's use Tom, just make the story simple. Tom wins the interim championship. Tom comes to the fight between Stipe and Jones. Tom sits in the front row. The camera's panned to him. We're all thinking they're going to get in. They're going to face off. Fight ends. Whoever wins between Stipe or John instantly retires. The moment those words come out of their mouth, I am retired. They are no longer champion, and the interim champion is elevated. So you wouldn't have a face-off. You wouldn't have anything ceremonial. He'll be in the front row and realize he just became champion. I mean, those things do happen. It's why it's there. They woke Matt Hughes up one day and told him he was champion. Jose Aldo and Ronda showed up at a press conference, never stepped foot in the octagon, found out they were world champions. Like, there is some times where these things happen. And if that was Henry's point, I wish he would have expanded on it. Because I do think we got to work around, and we're going to have to work around. We might as well get started and figure out how we're going to tell this story.